So this looks uh, interesting. You could ask the question, did this, pick did this physical picture that we developed depend on picking this renormalization scheme that I told you about? We kind of gave up on dim reg. We went over to, well, we gave up on MS bar. We went over to this, this scheme, which was off-shell momentum subtraction. In general, people don't like off-shell momentum subtraction because it makes calculations more difficult once you go to higher orders. Well, here the calculations are not so difficult, so we could do them, but you might be interested in adding pions to this theory or coupling external currents like photons, and then the calculations would get more difficult. And you'd like, for example, to have a dim reg MS bar type description of this power counting rather than a kind of minimal subtraction. Could I, get, could I kind of dress up minimal subtraction to get the same physical picture? That's a reasonable question to ask. The answer is you can. So there's something called power divergence subtraction scheme, different scheme than MS bar. So the PDS scheme. And what it says is, don't just subtract poles at d equals 4 like you do in MS bar, which were corresponding to logs of the cutoff but also subtract poles in d equals 3. And dim reg knows about power law divergences, and they're just poles at different places in the dimensions. And so if we subtract poles at d equals 3, we can track the power law divergences in that way. And it's the power law divergence that's actually causing, if you want to think of it as a change to the anomalous dimension, where the anomalous dimension was saying this thing was irrelevant to changing it to something relevant, you need a big change for that to happen. And the big change that's occurring is coming from a power law divergence here. That's what sort of allowed you to jump, if you like, from, from this fixed point to this one. The renormalization group, including the power law divergence, allows you to even flow between those points. Usually we think that power law divergences aren't doing anything. Here's an example where they are. They're not doing anything as long as you know you're at the right fixed point. If you're describing the right physics around one of these fixed points, you can concentrate on the logs. But if you don't know where you are, then the power law divergences could be crucial. All right, how does this scheme work? So this is a dim reg type scheme. So we're going to get the power of mu from the mu to the 2 epsilon that we have out front. So if I just write this guy down in d dimensions, here's what it looks like. And I've normalized mu slightly differently than we usually do just because it's convenient for this scheme to do that. So it's not exactly the same as MS bar. It's mu over 2 that I'm putting in. Other than that, it's the same kind of setup as MS bar. You'll see why I want to put that 2 there in a minute. OK, so this is just the result that we would write down for dimensional regularization. Dimensional regularization is not a scheme. Scheme has to be, do with what we subtract. But dim reg is just how we regulate. So now look at d equals 4. So in d equals 4, OK, there's a bunch of factors. This is just giving, this is the answer I quoted to you before. Just something finite. And if we look at d equals 3, then we have a pole because of that gamma function. And I put the 2 in here just to count for that, too. And so what this scheme says is to add 
uh, a power, uh, subtraction for this, this guy. So what we do is we add a counter term that looks like minus i m over 4 pi mu at 1 power of mu over 3 minus d c0 squared. And then if we take the graph plus the counter term and we set d equal 4, which is where we actually want to do physics, lo and behold, in this approach, we get actually the same answer as in our off-shell momentum subtraction scheme. And that's just really because this scheme tracks the power correction, or the power divergence, just like the off-shell momentum subtraction did. So we just invented a dim reg style of looking for poles that can track the same physics. And we just have to look at poles in d equals 3 rather than poles in d equals 4. Okay. And this is easier in general than the off-shell momentum subtraction schema, though. For basically everything we're talking about today, you could do either one. Now, where is the predictive power of this effective theory? So far, we've just kind of cooked things together to make the C0 do what we want. Well, we didn't completely cook things together. We switched to another scheme, and it kind of popped out naturally. But you could say, well, why not explore three other schemes and see if they work? <laughs> but let's just imagine that we got things to work, as we just did in two different ways, by tracking the power law divergence. The predictive power becomes from now the fact that if I say that's my fine tuning, that C0 got enhanced, I can now predict the size of all other operators in the theory. And other operators like C2 and C4, the power counting we assigned to them previously is not true. We have to figure it out. But we can figure that out once we know what, what approach we're, we should use. OK, so this gives the same as above. I won't go through it, but you know, same anomalous dimension, et cetera. And it's easier in general. Let's think about C2 mu. So if you look at C2, the first kind of diagram you could think about would be a guy with one C2, and then this is the first type of loop diagram you might think about. And these guys have a p squared, because C2 gave a p squared. So they have an extra p squared. And they diverge. They also have a power divergence. So if you calculate in either one of these schemes, off-shell momentum subtraction or this PDS scheme, these guys get a divergence. And again, it's a power law divergence, so there's a mu here. And you get a beta function that's that, 2c0, c2. So if you take the boundary condition c2 of 0, which is our ms bar result, 4 pi over m, a squared r0, and you solve this, you find c2 of mu is 4 pi over m, 1 over mu minus 1 over a squared, r0 over 2. So there's two. We previously, with our counting, when we were counting dimensions, we would have said C0 goes like 1 over lambda. C2 goes like 1 over lambda cubed. We had 2m plus 1 lambdas. What we've just discovered is that, yes, there's a lambda that from this r0. That's a 1 over lambda. But the other two lambdas are really mu's. So this operator is also enhanced. And it's enhanced by two powers. So once you know the leading order theory, you should be able to determine the power counting of all other, other operators, especially if they're not relevant ones. You have to get the relevant part right. And then you can use that Lagrangian to predict all the scaling for everything else. And that's what we've just done. squared lambda. Okay, And the, those powers of mu we see in this scheme. And the 1 over lambda comes from the r0. Okay, So what the rg actually does is it tells us, one way of thinking about it is that it tells us the enhancement due to fine tuning of all operators in the theory. 
And that's really because the fine tuning was just a change of our power counting. And we have to propagate that change everywhere. And we can do that, and it's the beta functions that tell us how to propagate the fine tuning. So if you keep going, you can do C2K of mu. You find it in almost dimension. This theory is kind of nice. You can basically do all the calculations. So when you go to CK, you get contributions from various lower order coefficients, and it's one loop exact, so you only have pairs. And then you can kind of contrast what's going on in a naive power counting where p is much less than 1 over a. Let's just go up to c4 versus this kind of improved power counting, which is valid when PA is greater than or order 1. So C0 hat went like 1 over mu, no suppression there. C2 hat goes like 1 over mu squared lambda, and that actually is irrelevant. But it's just irrelevant by one power. So relative to this guy, it's down by a p over lambda. And then interesting things start to happen with the higher ones, at least from an RG perspective. So these guys start to get more than one term. But this guy actually doesn't introduce a new constant. There's a piece of the anomalous dimension of this guy that's actually just fixed by the constant that you already had here, and then there's a new piece. So the new piece is down by two powers of lambda. And that's encoding things about the amplitude, actually. But OK, so that's just a little table to kind of convince you that once you have a beta function that you can compute for the coefficients, you can quickly propagate this enhancement of, from the fine tuning to the rest of your theory, i.e., figure out what the power counting is for all the operators. Uh, every time there is a power law divergence, should I be worried that an MCMS bar should I be worried that the power counting is wrong? Every this time, is like a very particular case where Yeah, every time there's a power law divergence, it's worth thinking about whether it has some physical impact on your on what you're doing. I think. If you know that you're if you can convince yourself that you're expanding around the right fixed point, then you're okay. That's my equivalence claim. But you don't necessarily know that. So let's go back to our amplitude and see what's going on here and see what it looks like with this power counting. And so it's really just a different expansion of that amplitude that we had. Call this M. And in either the PDS scheme or the our divergence subtraction scheme, we end up with this amplitude in, in the case where we would use that scheme. So you can see in PDS that if I set this coefficient to 0, the denominator becomes 1, and then I get with the off-shell momentum subtraction scheme. In PDS, it's a little harder to see that it gives just that, but it actually gives the same thing in either scheme. And if you think about what type of expansion you're doing here, you're keeping C0 to all orders, so your amplitude At lowest order is just this, and then the C2 term looks like that, and then there's some higher terms which I wrote in my notes, but I won't write here. And what this is, is this here is some kind of interaction, like a bigger circle, which sums up all the bubbles with C zeros in them. That's what's happened here. And this here, if you like, is like taking C2 and then dressing it with bubbles on either side. So there's two, there's the bubbles, and the bubbles on the other side, and then 
bubbles on both sides. So we calculate these loop graphs, and these are the amplitudes we get, and that's because we're treating the C0 coupling to all orders we're summing it up. And actually, each of these amplitudes, if you look at the RGE, is mu independent, explicitly mu independent. Okay, so it's like Kyle perturbation theory where we're doing a momentum expansion and order by order in that momentum expansion, the amplitude is independent of the scale mu. The only purpose of the scale mu is to help us think about power counting of these operators. In the end of the day, when we make physical predictions, then we're getting mu independent answers. Okay? And this is like organizing, if you like, and you put it in terms of If you put it back in terms of A, this is like organizing the theory this way, where you keep all powers of AP, and that makes it very clear that it's mu independent. Now, this part of the theory is so simple, you could have figured that out just by writing the top line down in terms of A's and P's and just writing this down, line down. But you could also use what I've been talking about to figure out, for example, say I coupled an external photon to my four nucleon operators. How big is this? Okay. Well, it actually gets enhanced from the fact that the scattering length is large, and you can figure out how important this, this effect is. And when people do uh, things like um, deuteron formation in the sun and stuff like that, they, they use this effective theory to do higher order calculations and make predi pre precision predictions for deuteron physics. So it's not just a, a toy model, it's actually something that has a real impact on some physics. We'll talk a little bit more about it next time. We'll talk a little bit about the conformal symmetry, and I'll talk a little bit more about the deuteron, since that's something interesting in this theory, and then we'll go on from there. So, any questions? It's cool stuff. Simple to do calculations. It's kind of interesting to think about.